1942, World War II is in full force and it's ravaging nations. A football match is being played in a city under Nazi occupation. This is a match between good and evil, the righteous and the sinful. A match refereed by the occupying soldiers in a field surrounded by men bearing arms. If the team of enslaved locals beat their rivals, they will pay for their victory with their lives. The occupants encourage the rivals to lose before the game. But this is more than just a game. This is about freedom, principles, honor. They beat their opponents 5-3 and are subsequently gunned down before they even have a chance to change their jerseys. Now, if you feel like you've heard or read about this story before, that's completely normal because that match we're talking about actually took place and it has inspired many novels and motion pictures, including the cult classic Escape to Victory, as well as the Burt Reynolds blockbuster The Longest Yard and its remake Mean Machine. But in truth, any and every sports movie about an underdog team. But it took the world many decades to understand that the events that unfolded in this historic match were, in reality, really quite different. The courageous, honorable men who fought against oppression were heroic in their acts, but the aftermath of the game had loose ends. Was this Soviet propaganda? If not, how much of it was true? And what happened to the men who played in that fateful match? Welcome back to The Football Files, and today we're going back 80 years in time to discuss the death match. Act 1, a fresh start. The year is 1942, and following the launch of Operation Barbarossa, Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, Kiev is under Nazi occupation. Under the strict authoritarian regime, life looks nothing like it used to. The Nazis have already deported thousands of Ukrainians to forced labor camps in Germany, and for the ones who somehow managed to stay, there's nothing but horror. The Bolsheviks and the Jewish population are being hunted and executed en masse. People between the ages of 15 and 60 are subject to different labor obligations. Everything is under extreme surveillance, including football. The Germans have abolished all sports clubs and are only letting newly founded clubs breathe. One such club is Ruk, the movement, founded by football trainer, reporter, and Nazi sympathizer Georgi Dmitriev Shvetsov. Shvetsov approaches former Dynamo Kiev players, the same Dynamo that would produce Andriy Shevchenko, and tries to convince them to play for his team. Trusevich, a famous goalkeeper of his time, is among his initial targets, but Shvetsov's reputation on the streets of Kiev is that of a collaborator, a traitor who'd betray his own countrymen in favor of the Nazi regime. So his efforts go in vain. Trusevich, on the other hand, has other problems to solve before joining a football team, such as avoiding death by the cold and hunger that the Germans had forced upon him. Among the very lucky few prisoners of war that were released by the Nazis in the early days of 1942, Trusevich is back in Kiev and desperate. The only silver lining is that his wife and daughter escaped the tyranny suffered by fellow members of the city's Jewish population. Their lives remained intact. One day, wandering the city and awaiting his slow death, Trusevich hears his name called out. The man, overjoyed and surprised in equal measure to see him, is Josef Kordik. An avid fan of Soviet football and a huge Dynamo Kiev supporter, Kordik is the boss of a bakery and doesn't think twice about offering Trusevich a job. The ex-keeper gladly accepts and starts working in the bakery. Not long after though, he realizes his employer's motives. For starters, Kordik is Czech by birth and not an Austrian with a Ukrainian wife as he convinced the Germans to believe, thanks to his perfect command of the language. And two, he utterly hates the Nazis. Not only that, but Kordik has an idea to fight the Nazis, not in the trenches, but on a football field. Convincing his new employee, he establishes a football club, FC Start. And that's how the story of one of, if not the most mythical football team, well, starts. With the help of Kordik, Trusevich makes some big transfers by reaching out to former Dynamo Kiev and Lokomotiv Kiev players, offering them to join FC Start in the form of a job at the bakery. They all accept, since the majority of them are ex-Red Army soldiers, and it's imperative for them to have normal jobs in order to maintain a low profile. Made up of nationwide known ex-professional footballers, FC Start begin training in the courtyard of the bakery. 
In the meantime, Rook's founder, Shvetsov, convinces the Germans to relaunch football events. A return to normality, at least on the surface. And it's at this point that games between FC Start and Rook start to take place. Instantly, the games between the two sides become eagerly awaited spectacles, as in the eyes of the public, these games represent Patriots versus Traitors. Understandably, FC Start beat Rook on every occasion, as one team is a patchwork squad made up of everyday folk who happen to love the game, and the other is made up of people who once made a living out of it. Trusevich and company have seven documented games between June and July 1942. Along with Rook, they have rivals in the form of fellow Ukrainian team sport, three Hungarian military teams, a team from the German artillery, and the German railway team. FC Start's dominance is evident as they score 37 and concede only eight goals, winning every single game they play. Beating whoever comes before them in emphatic fashion, FC Start gained popularity by the hour much to Shvetsov's, but more importantly, Germany's disgust. The Nazis decide that they must put an end to the ensuing Patriots beating the invaders discourse and send their best team, the Flak Elf, to Kiev. Housing the best footballing talent the country possesses and consisting of players under the service of the Luftwaffe, the aerial warfare branch of the German Wehrmacht, Flak Elf are seen as an unbeatable force by the Nazis. However, on August 6, 1942, FC Start provide Flak Elf with a pretty violent wake-up call by beating them 5-1, setting up the scene for the deathmatch. Act 2, the deathmatch. After their humiliation, the Germans wasted no time ordering a rematch. The posters prepared for the occasion had the word revenge written all over it, and the two teams faced each other once again on August 9, 1942. Now, we don't know whether the sides had set up an away goal rule or not, but it didn't matter, as FC Start beat Flachelf once again, this time by five goals to three. Contrary to the previous match, though, there were very few reports covering the match. That said, the final score was indeed 5-3, and the game was played in front of 2,000 local fans, but the lack of further information paved the way for different retellings of the story, and we'll get to that in a second. But FC Start went on to play another game on August 16th, 1942. Once again, they were up against Vetsov Rook, battering them 8-0 this time. A few days later, on August 18th and 20th, the Gestapo forces burst into Kordex Bakery and arrested a total of eight FC Start players, putting an end to the club's short-lived history. Act 3, Truth Surrounded by Myth. The war ended a few years later, and with the defeated Nazis gone, the Soviet Union was back in control. Trying to reinstate a sense of patriotism and unity amongst its war-torn people, the reality was altered through propaganda by the Soviets on many occasions. The death match was no different, and the Soviet version of the story spread like wildfire, not only in Kiev, but throughout the whole Union. This version of the story was brutal, to say the least, and as Mark Twain once said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. It certainly did. According to legend, German officials had threatened FC Start players in their dressing room before the match started, warning them that a possible Start victory would mean immediate execution of the whole squad. Some fictionalized accounts also suggested that the players were forced to give the Nazi salute before the kickoff. The field was surrounded by armed Nazi soldiers, and the match was officiated by a high-ranking Gestapo officer. FC Start wore red on that fateful day, symbolizing the blood of the workers, the power of the Union, and the solidarity among its people. As the players didn't follow the Nazi orders and actually beat the Flak Elf, they were directly taken to Babi Yar, a ravine in Kiev used by the Nazis whenever they executed thousands of people. FC Start players were gunned down in Babi Yar, still wearing their red jerseys. For decades, the legend of the deathmatch circulated among the Union, and with each passing year and each retelling, it became more and more violent, penetrating the very fabric of Ukrainian culture. In reality, FC Start players were not immediately executed. I mean, like I said in the previous chapter, they even played another game after the deathmatch. There was a photograph of FC Start and Flak Elf players together, taken just after the game, but it was never printed in the Soviet Union, as it drastically contradicted the Soviets' version of the events. 
Information revealed long after the death match took place suggested that the two teams had even met at a party the same evening where they enjoyed some homemade vodka. Although these facts didn't match the most popular version of the story of the death match, they don't mean that life after the game was a bed of roses for the FC Star players. On the contrary, actually. What followed the arrests of the 18th and 20th of August 1942 was nothing short of devastating. For starters, the arrests weren't made because FC Start beat Flak Elf, as recounted in numerous versions of the event. Rather, some players believed that it was Shvetsov's doing. He was so fed up with getting beaten by FC Start that he had convinced the Germans that the majority of the team consisted of Soviet agents. Other versions explaining the arrest suggested that the bakery where FC Start players used to work had been delivering loaves of bread filled with smashed glass to the Germans. The first two FC Start players killed were Chachenko and Krotkik. The first was one of the three policemen playing for the team who was shot by an SS officer while attempting to escape the Gestapo. The second was tortured to death by the Germans as he was believed to be a Soviet agent. Other players were sent to the Siretz concentration camp next to the Babi Yar ravine. Nikolai Trusevich, Alexei Klemenko, Ivan Kuzmenko, Pavlo Komarov, Mikhail Putistin, Fedor Tyuchev, Makar Honcharenko, and Mikhailo Sviradovsky. After three years of forced labor, three players were executed in the camp. Klemenko, Kuzmenko, and FC Start's very first player, Trusevich, were added to the real death toll of the death match. 30 years ago, on the 50th anniversary of the death match, the voice of Makar Honcharenko was heard on Kiev radio. As a surviving member of FC Start who was forced to repair German soldiers' shoes during his years in forced labor, his take on the whole issue might be the most poignant among all the things said about the event. Talking about his teammates executed at the Siretz concentration camp, Honcharenko said, they died like many other Soviet people because the two totalitarian systems were fighting each other and they were destined to become victims of that grand scale massacre. Truer words have never been spoken. So without blurring the lines any more than they already are, we'll wrap up this episode of The Football Files. For all the fallen members of FC Start and to the other people who have lost their lives or suffered under the occupying and authoritarian regimes, we offer our deepest sympathies. And for all the people who are currently fighting that very same war, our thoughts are with you. <laughs>